Hello, everybody. My name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I'm an author, idiot, and loin streamer. And today we're going to be talking about a couple of different book related topics. Uh, one of them has to do with the rampant sexism that's in general existing <laughs> and getting worse because people are just getting angry. And instead of actually just having discussions and talking to people one to one, it's a lot of generalization in order to insult people because there's a lot of assumption in general that if you disagree with somebody on something, then they must be all of the worst things that you can possibly imagine. And I might be taking this in a direction that you're not expecting. We'll see. I'm going to use a Guardian's article to first introduce a version of the topic. Um, and then I'm going to bring in some other things that I have noticed. And I am looking forward to your guys' discussions in the comments below. Then I wanted to talk about a secondary thing that the article for the topic is titled Books with Neurodivergent Characters Mark New Chapter for Publishers. So I want to talk about uh, using special interests again for marketing and reducing people reducing experiences down to genre tags and marketing and while how it cheapens the story and generally is way more insincere not to toot my own horn on like the way that i write but i can only give examples of the way that i do things and also things that I don't like. And again, I'm looking forward to your thoughts on it. There are no, theoretically, there are no wrong answers here because the point of what I do on this channel with these Saturday videos, specifically on these topics, is to get conversation out there, to get people talking because so much is so hostile and so angry that I think it just makes the issue worse instead of allowing us to have conversations to see people and perspectives as just that. But before we get started, number one, if you enjoy what I do here on the channel, please remember to like, share, and subscribe for more. Number two, if you would like to be featured on the channel, check out the links down in the description below. The number one way to be featured is through Lemoy, the monthly prompt writing contest where I give you a prompt. You write a short story using that prompt, and on the first Monday video of the month, we bask in your creativity. The second way to be featured is if you are an indie author and you have a book out or a book that is coming out, if you submit your cover and your first chapter, it'll be read here on the channel to hopefully help more readers find your work because I may not be your reader. I might be your reader. I, some of those I read and I immediately go and buy them to add them to my readers list. So, you know, but then there's also the chance that other people will find them. And I want to help other people find your work. You've done the work. It's out there. Time to find those readers. The third thing is if you would like to check out any of my books, judge my abilities, I mean, feel free to rip them apart. I don't, your experience is your experience. Uh, you can get them at any of your favorite places to get books, including your local library upon request. With that said, let's get into the topic. It's probably gonna be somewhat spicy, but that's just the nature of things. The first article is by Lucy Knight, entitled, Boys Mustn't Be Afraid of Female-Led Books, says author Joanne Harris. There's so many layers to this right now. I don't know if I'll be able to remember them all. Let's get it straight from the start. In general, and this is a generalization, I, you know, there are plenty of people do not fall into generalizations, which is very specifically one of the reasons I want to have this conversation, because right now I see a lot of people generalizing one way or the other. This case, it is saying, hey, like things that you don't like. No, like, no. Um, and there's also an issue of, I've seen people say, that they will be skeptical, and this is men and women, by the way, skeptical of books that are written by women because they don't know whether or not to, because a lot of books written by women will surprise you with smut, like not even just references to sex, but they will surprise you with hardcore sex and or man hating inside of them. Now, granted, books by men can also run into that, but you have a higher propensity, especially right now in like romanticy, uh, with running into hardcore sex scenes in YA and fantasy written by women. And so more people are skeptical of reading those books if it has a female's name on the cover. Secondarily, people are also a little more skeptical of reading women-led books because you're more likely to get girl bosses. You're more likely to get the man-hating. A lot of stories actually are insulting to men as the as the female character gets stronger that's one of the things i'll talk about it later when i talk i'll talk i'll mention it again later when i talk into about some of the books that i've read recently because i'm going to include i watched the movie argyle with a couple of friends and while i did enjoy the movie it's kind of it's over the top it's satirical spy movie the thing that bothered me the most in that movie and here's a spoiler alert uh if you haven't seen the movie but the thing that's bothered me the most is at the beginning of the movie, the male spy was very competent. He was very powerful. He obviously had his, you know, 
everything in order. He was great at fighting. He was protecting the woman. And as the woman became more powerful, as the co-star became more powerful and came into herself, he started becoming more and more nincompoopish. And he started becoming more of an accessory to her while she took care of everything. And my problem with that is it often happens in a lot of these stories with female, with strong female characters that the female, that the male character has to be emasculated, dethroned, depowered in order to make the female character look better. Instead of allowing the female character to to come up to the level of the male spy and then letting them work as a team, it had to diminish his abilities. And that's not to say that he was totally useless at the end of the story because he showed great love at the end of Argyle. However, he did not have the suaveness or the skills that he had at the beginning of the movie. And I get really sick of female-led shows or female-led stories that have to emasculate or insult the male counterparts. You can have a story of teamwork. You can have a story of love. You can even have a story where they fight each other and fix things. But when one has to look stupid in order for the other one to look better, it's a problem. And it's, it's well, it's something that bothers me. Some people obviously like it, but I absolutely hate it. But it's also a reason why people might stray away from reading female-led books. One thing that I can absolutely, I, I can say that I did not like Zenith. Okay, it was long, it was boring because of the number of points of view that it kept switching. It felt even longer, it was a slog. But what I can say about that book is that, you know, Dax was still kind of not the greatest, but what it, it still didn't just demean every male character, despite being a group of females at the lead. Then you've got the secondary problem here in the subheading where it says, teaching must change to prevent violence against women, she said at a hay festival, also speaking on the narratives of menopause. <laughs> that is such a mixture of things. Okay, reading fiction specifically with female leads, is not a teaching opportunity. Yes, you can become empathetic, more empathetic by reading fiction, well, written fiction specifically, because poorly written fiction is just going to make people angry because it's not nice. And a lot of fiction is actually caustic right now. But fiction is also not meant to be a learning opportunity. Anyway, getting into the article so we can continue with this discussion. Boys should be encouraged to read books about girls, said author Joanne Harris, because a boy who is afraid to read a book with a girl protagonist will grow up into a man who feels that it is inappropriate for him to listen to a woman's voice. I think that is overreaching into why somebody might not want to pick up a female written book or a female led book. But I also think that that kind of language is disrespectful to the man's intelligence, disrespectful to men in general, and also is not going to help your case. It's going to actually possibly, probably create more resentment and be like, who the frick do you think you are? Uh, I also think that it is pretty insulting to say somebody is afraid of something in the same way that if somebody said, I think that you need to read more graphic sexual books because you're just afraid of reading it. No, I just don't like it. And forcing somebody to read something that they do not want to read unless it's school for the purpose of learning is not going to be helpful. Trying to insult, demean, diminish, browbeat somebody into obeying what you think that they should be doing is only going to cause not just resentment towards you, but towards the thing that you are trying to get people to do. And so you need to entice people by making it inviting, by making it fun, by making it comforting. In the same way that what if they were like, hey, you need to read more male written books, more, more sleazebag books like Teleshop USA so that you can understand a man. Because that book, guys, get ready for the freaking rant when I talk about that book and sickening. Nobody should be trying to force anybody to read anything. It's your time. It's your efforts. It's, it's your interest. It's your analysis. And this sort of thing is not helping anyone. The author of Chocolate told an audience at the Hay Festival in Wales that if violence against women was to be prevented, it needs to be addressed really early, long before an actual crime happens. Harris, who taught in an all-boys school for 15 years, said that the way we educate our children must change if we wanted to see fewer crimes against women. She said, we have to stop girls we have to stop girls being apologetic when they have done nothing wrong. We have to stop boys being entitled when they're actually not entitled entitled to have more than anybody else. We have to stop teaching them differently as teachers. That will help a lot. That's a pretty vague statement um, in general. And in some cases, 
I cannot believe what she is saying. I need more more uh, information on what exactly she is saying. Because while nobody, it's not just women that shouldn't apologize when they haven't done anything wrong. A lot of people apologize when they haven't done anything wrong. I can tell you, I banned the word I'm sorry slash sorry in general from the server a couple of times. Because people have a tendency to over-apologize or to think that they're an inconvenience. And I have a couple of friends who do the same thing where it's like, I will go to spend time with them. I love my friends. I love my family. If I'm spending time with you it's because I like you I want to hear from you I want to hear about your day I want to hear about your time and you don't need to apologize for telling me about you yourself what you're doing but people like automatically do it as if they are in as if they are a problem for just existing now what I was taught as a child is that if you apologize to somebody tell them what you are apologizing for because a blanket I'm sorry one turns into a, a knee-jerk reaction where it's just oh this is just how it is number two it tells me that you're not really possibly thinking about what you might have done wrong and three if, if you're required to say what you are apologizing for then it says you acknowledge what you did wrong and then if you've got a frivolous apology that is going to just make you feel bad you're not going to say it because you can't think of what you're actually apologizing for. Like you're not an imposition on somebody else just by existing, especially if they're choosing to be around you. So that's one of the things. There's also in general, sometimes, and I don't wanna put words in this author's mouth, but I do know that in some conversations, they're like, stop telling women that they need to be careful. No, everybody needs to be careful in general because bad people exist. If you go back to even the book review from this week, where it was the second half of Amygdala by Sam Fenna, you had Lucy who went to a commune that was just nice people doing nice things sharing their supplies and she goes well what if i want to take everything you can't stop bad people from doing bad things if they think that they are entitled to abusing you so what you have to do is protect yourself against them no amount of education is going to stop a bad person who doesn't care if you look at the conversations around the generative ai when you're saying hey people are people can we respect people can you not call people you know maggot filled scumbags that are worse than that are that are lesser evolved lesser good versions of computers can we just respect the sanctity of human life of the human soul can we have that base the answer is no if somebody doesn't want to respect you as a human being then there's nothing that you can do oh my gosh this reminds me of so a couple of years ago when i was in a local writing group that did plays and put on stage plays so it would it would critique stage plays and then it would put them on it would choose one that was submitted to them to put on every year or a couple of them and one of them was about human trafficking that was one of them where i was the house manager for and so i gotta listen to it a bunch and in this middle of this story that was about human trafficking in order to spread awareness because they also had because they also had a connection with a local shelter or a local uh group for this sort of thing they stopped the story to have somebody in the story come forward and lecture the audience about how terrible human trafficking is. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, correct me if I'm crazy, but if there was actually a human trafficker in the audience who did that as their job, seeing a stage play that is a mockery of what their actual job is, let's be real, it's, it doesn't actually touch n anywhere near the brutality of the reality of what they see at work every day because they're doing it for real. What's on stage is acted and clean. So you're not actually going to guilt anybody with a stage play, and you're not actually going to lecture anybody who is a human trafficker through a stage play. You're not going to change any minds by doing a stage play that lectures because anybody that is here that is watching this that is crying because of the conditions already thinks that human trafficking is wrong so who are you lecturing and that goes back to this this might seem really far off but a lot of people in this situation tend to tell women specifically but it should be considered all because because men are the victims of most crimes okay because men are more likely to be victims of any crime which includes sexual crime if you include rape in jail so everybody equal opportunity crime right and so it is up to both the individual to take care of themselves and not expect the world to cater to them so when you usually have this tell girls to stop apologizing no you need to be cognizant of when you hurt somebody and what it is that you're doing that might hurt somebody but men need to do the same thing we need to both equally respect our peers the people around us and take consideration of our surroundings to take care of ourselves and our friends and who we are with it's not any blanket issue and it's doing these sorts of blanket statements that put people in danger and then you think look people who are going to abuse others are not going to change their mind by reading a book i'm sorry <laughs> 
that's not where it is. You change people's minds and you help people see differently by showing compassion, by being a person, by being a good person, by having an effect to show that difference. And you can't even change everyone because some people just don't want to. Again, look at Lucy. That's just what happens. If people want to be selfish, they're going to be selfish. And what can you do then? Pretty much nothing. Quote, also, we've got to stop giving them the message that it's wrong for a boy to read books about girls because even schools are giving them this message. And this is where the problem happens, where women's voices are perceived as less. Okay, there are a lot of issues regarding women's fiction and fiction written by women. Number one, we go back to where I mentioned the sex issue before. That can show up much more surprisingly within women's fiction than I think with men's fiction and being graphic. Number two, men and women enjoy different things as a whole. Now, that's not saying every woman enjoys a certain thing or every man enjoys a certain thing. I was listening to a podcast last night and you know what has actually happened recently is I've gotten to see a lot of people just become straight up bigots. Uh, and I, I mean that in an unironic, non meme way, is if I'm listening to a podcast that says, oh, women can't write, women can't draw, women, d women have no business being in any creative field because all they do is self-insert and men don't self-insert, but women only self-insert read. I am tired of listening to people say, hey, come to us, come give us a chance because we are different and we are going to, you know, welcome people creatively. And then you go and you listen and people are honestly just bigots. I can accept that women and men generally speaking, make up the audiences of different things. Women are the biggest consumers of romance and erotica. Men are the bigger consumers of pornography because they are the visual medium of that thing. Men are also generally the bigger consumers of fantasy books that have big world building because in psychology, we've seen the studies that show that women are more people focused and men are more thing focused. Now that doesn't mean every woman is going to love romance or self-insertion fiction and every man is going to love highly intricate uh, fantasy or sci-fi fiction. This also becomes a point of perspective when you're talking about the type of reader that someone is, be it the kind of person that wants to self-insert or the kind of person that wants to be voyeuristic and watch in on someone else's life. And I've noticed this in my own works because I think with Joey, because she is such a messy person, like she makes so many bad decisions. You're not going to want to self-insert on her because she makes bad decisions. You're going to live a bad life if you're like inside of her and you're going to be like, I did no, no, I this is not a good time. And I think often when you end up with self-insert fiction is when you have these situations where authors are protecting these characters from consequence because you don't want anything bad to happen to the self-insert character. This is your dream. And I'm getting kind of sick of hearing people assume that females can only write self-inserts and males don't write self-inserts when bad writing is just bad writing. Tropey writing is just tropey writing. Self-inserts are just self-inserts and it is not a gendered issue. We can understand that trends work a certain way and that demographics work a certain way, that men are going to like certain books and not like certain other books on average, just like women on average will be drawn to different content. It's not helpful to anyone to say that you should be forced to go and imbibe on something that you do not enjoy. And that, I think, this specific topic is something that is causing a rift and causing more anger and more resentment towards both people because it's got women saying, men need to read these books, and then men are saying, uh, you're ruining my getaway. You're ruining the things that I like to do. You're trying to tell me what to do. You're trying to control what I read. And so then it's becoming backlash against all women. And uh, then everybody's just getting insulted and um, saying, get out of my face. That's pretty much what I have been seeing, honestly. Speaking during the literary festival entitled Women of a Certain Age, Harris described her latest novel, Broken Light, as a menopause carry. It's, that's something that would not interest me either. You cannot... Okay. Writing a story like that, where it's very specific to women's issues, you are appealing to a female audience. Understand this, when you write about menopause, you are writing about a specific audience that isn't even all women. I am not interested in women's issues. I am not interested in stories like a menopause memoir. You know how many old women I've heard writing memoirs about menopause or stories about menopause? I don't freaking care. I want that away from me. I want adventure. I want love stories. I want stories about love, not romances. I want stuff like what I'm going to be doing with the Westies with Monty or like with the Easties with Monty or like what happens in Bodymore. I don't want menopause, Carrie. And you have to understand when you write certain things, when you write about the dynamic, when you write about women's fiction style things, you're going to be writing for a mainly female audience and men do not need to be forced to read that. In the same way that I would say men who write stories that are power fantasies, that are harem fantasies, you know, like an, an uh, omni, enemy, enemy, 
Anime, which was a lit RPG where the guy lived in Clown World decided to go and get a, a, a VR basic casket to go into an RPG where he could OP everything, get all of the special powers, have all of the girls want to bang him, and uh, can attack the Stacys, which are which were the bad guys. Or stuff like Teleshop USA, where the guy is a sleazy cheat, cheating on his wife for 20 years, saying that she's okay with it until she actually finds out that he's sleeping with her, his co-host, and then she's like, oh, you need to get out of the house. And then this guy who's been cheating on his wife since the day that they were married, shits on her, insults his children, wants to quit his job so that he doesn't have to pay child support or alimony to the wife who has been his stay-at-home wife taking care of him and his children for 20 years. Wife? Why? He's the one that cheated. To tell me that I have to read a memoir that is a male power fantasy of abusing women and sleeping with every hottie that comes across you because I need more understanding is asinine. So I don't know why you would tell somebody to do the other, do it the other way, okay? We need compassion, we need understanding, and you need to understand that when you are writing a certain thing, the entire market is not open to you. You are writing a niche thing when you're writing menopause carry, and nobody wants to be forced to read that. You're not oppressed because people don't want to read your women's fiction. Write something that people want to read or stop complaining. Instead of giving her protagonist paranormal abilities at puberty, as Stephen King did in his best-selling novel, her character, Bernie Ingram, gains supernatural powers as she reaches menopause. <laughs> menopause is one of the things that we choose not to talk about because we think people are going to judge us on them, Harris said. Part of the reason that she wanted to write about it is because issues we are encouraged to keep private grow and grow unless we externalize some part of it. You're allowed to write whatever you want to write, but trying to act like it's some civil rights issue or women are getting abused because they're not reading Menopause Carrie is ridiculous. Harris was critical of the way that the case of Nicola Boli, who was found dead after going missing near the Lancashire River this year, was framed. During the search period, police released information that Boli had been struggling with alcohol use and symptoms of pre-menopause. After that, the narrative became less a mother disappears in mysterious circumstances and much more a menopausal woman finds her way to the river, Harris said. The implication is that if you are a young mother and attractive, then you are valuable and therefore your death is a tragedy, but if you are a menopausal woman, you are a high risk and a low value. That's just reading deep into things that uh, you don't need to read that deep into, man. It's not that deep. And I feel like so many people read deeper into things than they actually are, then give, put malice to things that aren't actually malicious, and then turn it into a cause. And so I think that this sort of thing, personally, and this is just, I, I have to aggregate information from what I've seen over years, so I'm sorry that I can't like, bam, 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 all you have to do is like turn on some Ethan Van Skyver streams and you can see him just insulting women as well. And you can do it all over the place. It just gets sickening to me. I want to give support and I want to see multiple things, but at some point, I'm at the point where everybody sucks, okay? Over here, you've got, and the last couple of weeks have been chock full of people continuing to just insult every female character who, who isn't busty and covered in makeup, which includes the newer designs of Laura Croft, where she has smaller breasts because she's athletic, she's younger, and that's considered bad. I listened to Ethan Van Skyver say, if you have A cup of breasts, you're basically a disabled woman. Great. Good to know that everybody's everybody's value only comes from breast size and making sandwiches. Like that's, you're wondering why people might not want to be seen as women or might be rejecting the idea of women while also saying that women can't write, women can't draw, women can't do anything. They're just selfish and making women look like the worst possible thing ever to be because all you can do is be menopausal, carry or self-insert porn and just be useless because everybody will call you useless and everybody will mock you. No matter what you do, you can never be better than whatever it is that they think and you will always just be dismissed or asked for tits. So that's getting frustrating and so is the, just the conversation on every female character, which is not actually every female character. They continually, continuously just take two or three or four pictures of the same characters of games and say that they are all ugly while not using other N not using other shots, not acknowledging that there are other games in the in the world to go and see if you want those shots, calling panty shots of Ashley in Resident Evil 2 being part of her character development. Like, are you kidding me? 
it's been frustrating. Like what you like, enjoy what you want to enjoy, but uh, I'm actually being forced to see the sexism on both sides now, where I would much rather just be creating things and loving things and adoring things and doing the things that I want to do, but ah. Uh, if some people had their way, I wouldn't be allowed to draw or write or have an opinion. Going over here to books with neurodivergent characters mark the new chapters of publishers. Children's books featuring protagonists who are autistic or have ADHD are going to the highest bidder. So this is the current trend in publishing and writing. You can see it at AWP if you go and look at AWP's backlog of schedules where they're doing a lot of things now that focus on selling mental illness or mental health. And the problem is that generally it is just a marketing scam. It's the same thing as banned books where banned and books is just a way to sell books. This is the same thing as using people's racial makeup in order to sell books. You're nothing but a marketing label. And generally people that put this stuff up front the most, they are often the least kind when it comes to somebody who actually has mental issues. Regardless of how you feel about people, when they say something inappropriate and then they go, oh, it's a mental issue, you can either show compassion and say, I understand, or I don't know if I believe you, but I'm going to back off and wait until I know. Or you can just call that person a liar because you think that mental health is something that you tailor for social media. Like mental illness and mental issues are not attractive. They're not fun, they're distracting, they hurt your your life, your involvements. You have to figure out different ways to cope with them to make them work. Not only that, but every time I've run into specific descriptions of mental illness in books, it's usually done in a very acting way. The last book that I can remember mentioning the character is autistic was Among the Hunted, and that's because I don't really go out of my way. Actually, you know, I think Pawn and the Puppet tried to do that too. And obviously Pawn and the Puppet is full of a uh, fake version of mental illness. But in Among the Hunted, it had a nymph, because, you know, we're using Greek mythology characters here, that was described in a very textbook way as having symptoms of autism. And then there was a break in the narrative to actually inform the main character that she was autistic. Most stories that actually portray mental illness well or portray mental disabilities well are going to just show it in the way that the characters act, and you have to infer it. When, it. when a story breaks the narration in order to tell you, inform you that a character has something, it reads like virtue signaling to me, because it wants to make sure that you know that this character is this thing, as opposed to letting you have it. And you can look at body more, and the way that Joey acts, the way she makes decisions, the way that she responds to fear, to stimuli, you can see that she has PTSD. I didn't write it that way. Actually, I wrote the books, and then I eventually went and took the test that shows, like, it's like the 10-question test to see if you maybe you should go into a therapist if you have PTSD. And I'm pretty sure she got a 9 out of 10 on that. And it wasn't on purpose. It just shows in how her brain works. And that's how the best is. That's not to say that in a book you can't say straight up that a character has or does something. But I think we're kind of getting into an iffy territory at the, this point where I've seen people say, oh, that character is neurodivergent coded. Oh, that character is blank coded. Instead of just letting characters be characters and have whatever personality quirks or whatever behaviors going on that are appropriate for them, it's now a race to try to label them, and in some cases to use those labels to sell books, and frankly I think that that is disgusting. Moving down here, children's books that feature neurodiverse main characters are the latest publishing trend experts have said. I'm just thinking of like children's books titles that are just obviously um, classless, you know, like My Little Autist. Publishers, which were previously reluctant to approach the subject, are increasingly seeking out realistic and explicitly neurodiverse protagonists, often by authors who are themselves neurodivergent. So again, we have the, the forced outing of yourself, of your medical history, in order to put yourself above others to get published. And if you don't share your medical history, good luck actually getting published in these places. Number two, when you have to explicitly state it, then you're using it as a teaching moment, which I guess this is a children's book, so whatever. But I think that it's also going to generally be less realistic because you are now set, you're now telling the reader instead of showing the reader. L. McNichol who until now has been published only by small independent Knights Of, was recently at the center of a five publisher bidding auction for the world rights for her two, her next two young adult books, of which Macmillan's children's books was a, the eventual victor. 
The book, the first book is due next autumn. Largely credited with kickstarting the revolution, Mick Nicole, who won the 2020 Waterstones Children's Book Prize for her debut novel, A Kind of Spark, said that in the past, in the past year, she had seen a huge shift in publisher's attitude. Until very recently, neurodiverse characters and books have not been flattering or aspirational, she said. They've been written by non-neurodiverse authors and are so two-dimensional that they border on offensive. So there are a couple of issues that I have with this. One of them is that, no, you haven't been looking because you've been looking to be told what a character is because you are overly concerned with what other people are doing. Number two, you are somehow now saying that you are the monolith for what something looks like and you're going to bully people who do not out their medical histories in order to boost yourself above them morally unless they share what their, more, what their emotional, mental, or physical health background is. This happened with Carve the Mark. This happened with the author of Gideon the Nymph, though that was, was with child sexual assault. And this is just the next form of marketing where if you go back 10 15 years when John Green was first hitting it with the fault in our stars and you had the the pump of inspirational sick people it's insulting is what it is but you can like what you like but I personally think it's insulting all too often even where there is a neurodiverse character they are secondary and they die during the book their death is a rite of passage for the main character uh, I'm going to need proof of that because what I often see happening with statements like this is that it'll focus on a handful of things and not focus on the books that don't do that. I've seen people complain that redheads are always the bad guy. Well, what about all of the times when redheads are not the bad guy, when it is a blonde who is the bad guy? The blondes are often demonized in books when it's described as why are fat people always the bad guy? How about all of the times where skinny people are the bad guy? So this just becomes a situation of hyper fixation because you're so focused on it. And I think it, it kind of goes back to also hyper focusing on characters that are not female characters that are not pretty enough. And then it becomes this assumption that they're all ugly when it's actually not, you're just hyper fixated. She said that her success has made publishers realize that diversity is a commercial and not a moral issue. That says it all right there, guys. It's a commercial issue. As soon as diversity is not commercially good anymore, it's gonna go away because they don't really care. It's just about making money and they want you to sell your privacy to make money. For a long time, publishers didn't treat neurodiverse readers as customers, but now they are reassessing what they think neurodiversity is and realizing that while it might not be talked about in the corporate world or in office spaces, it's talked about in a lot of schools, which is where they are targeting their products. Lizzie Huxley Jones, whose first book in the VV Vivi Conway series was published in June, said being published was a refreshing example of publishers taking risks. Publishers are starting to realize that cases of neurodiversity are massively undi undi underdiagnosed across society and that there are more experiences out there in their target audiences than they have than they may have thought added Huxley Jones whose pronouns are they them but there is still a long way to go L's success has shown the hunger for authentic neurodiverse characters as opposed to the ones that we've had in the past who are written from the outside as a result are stereotypes lacking interiority emotionality and depth no, because you are now assuming other people's statuses, mind you, if they don't want to tell you. And in a way, in a way, you are telling other people that their experiences don't matter if it doesn't fit your definition of what something is supposed to look like or if the author of some book doesn't tell you that they fit some definition. You are discrediting and trying to make yourself the monolith of neurodiversity or of mental illness. Marina Magdalena's first book in the Antigons Kingsley series, which features a girl with attention deficit hyperactive disorder, was published in April. Magdalena, who has ADHD, wrote the book because she wanted her neurodivergent daughter to have a relatable female role model in fiction. Personally, I don't believe in role models in fiction. That's not the job of books. It's the job of your family. It's the job of somebody that you love and trust. It is not the job of fiction or books or movies. Growing up, my daughter struggled with book characters like Hermione Granger, who were super organized. She just felt so far removed from them, Magdalena said. I wanted to give her a character with all the brilliance, innovation, and in originality that so often comes with conditions like ADHD, but also who struggle with emotional regulation and organization. Look, this is a problem as well. This is when they're talking about females only being able to self-insert or the idea of representation where you have to be able to see yourself in a character. You don't 
need to see yourself in a character, right? A character that shows the experiences of something. And then maybe if somebody recognizes, hey, I feel that way too, that's great. But for somebody to be like, I can't empathize with that character because that character specifically is not me. Hermione Gringer isn't supposed to be you. Joey isn't supposed to be anybody but Joey. And if people empathize with her because they understand her plight, they understand the reason why she is the way she is, then great. But going into a book saying it needs to be, or going into any story, whether it's a movie or a video game or a book, and going that character needs to be somebody that I can specifically see or that I specifically want to see, be it because they're super hot or because it is a self-insert, is an inappropriate use of this. And you're actually not teaching your child to be empathetic, you're teaching your child to be narcissistic. Lauren Gardner, Nicole's agent at Belle Lomax Mor Moriton, said the publishing industry has really started to change and recognize that we need to be living in a world where any child can walk into a bookshop and see themselves reflected back at them. Wrong. Wrong. Why is everybody so focused on teaching narcissism? You don't need to walk into a bookstore and see yourself on the bookshelf since when is that the goal of authors? It's also creating a generation of people, not just a generation, generations of people that expect books to be mirrors. If you want a mirror, go to a beauty store. Books are meant to be stories, entertainment. Maybe you can see yourself in them, maybe you can't, but the purpose is not to walk in and see yourself. It's to find the story, experience the story, and experience a life. A lot of people are realizing that we are all more neurodiverse and less neurotypical than we previously realized. Well, when everyone's neurodiverse, then nobody is neurodiverse. Maybe you just have a personality. Elle's work is revolutionary, and I think that it has given other publishers an opportunity to see how they can follow suit and give more authors like Elle an opportunity that perhaps they wouldn't have previously had. Emily Beter from Magdalena Publisher, SPCK, said that big influences on the publishers had been parents' increasing willingness to buy books with neurodivergent protagonists. In the past, publishers might have thought parents didn't want their kids reading about children who struggle to regulate their emotions, but it's different nowadays. Today's gentler parenting is about helping your children reach their full potential, not by shaming them for not being able to do something, but in an alternative way, if possible. Carolyn Carpenter from Booksellers, a trade magazine, agreed, historically there have been there hasn't been much neurodiversity in children's publishing, but things are changing, and one of the really important steps forward has been people who are neurodivergent themselves writing neurodiverse characters. Again, there's no way for you to know this unless people were outing themselves, and have you actually done analysis on behaviors of characters? Because I highly doubt that if you really looked at books, you wouldn't see these neurodiverse behaviors. What you're asking for is to be told it. You're asking for your hands to be held instead of reading critically, instead of analyzing, and that is a you problem. Small publishers are leading the way, but the big publishers are catching on. Tom Purser, head of guidance, volunteering, and campaigns of the National Autistic Society, said, There has been a disappointing lack of neurodiverse protagonists in books for children and young people, but it's brilliant to see that this is changing with more and more diverse characters, with more and more neurodiverse characters being represented in literature. Many people learn about what life is like for neurodiverse people through reading books, so it's important that these depictions are realistic and represent challenges neurodiverse people face as well as huge contributions that they make to society. Obviously, I disagree with this because I think if your goal is to use a book to educate about life, then you're going to mislead people. Your book is not going to represent all people with an experience under a label. It's going to represent only that one character. And so this broad idea that is constantly brought forward that you writing a book is going to shed light on how all people experience is only going to actually create false negatives, false positives, where people go and accuse others of not being something because they don't look the way you think they should look according to that book you read one time that said this is real life. I'm sorry. Books, movies, television shows, they're all a beautified or convenient version of real life because you can't actually perfectly express real life through a book, especially considering people will experience books differently. Now, you can learn and get different experiences from a book than you would get in other places. But to claim that any single book is going to be a representative that should be used to educate people is setting everybody up for failure. You're setting people up to actually start testing or challenging or a accusing people of things if they put anything in books and it actually clamps down on not only freedom but creativity. It makes people worry about what they're writing. 
I can't stop people from writing certain things, from being a certain way, and I would never want to. But I also don't want people breathing down my neck about the things that I choose to write either. I have books set in different periods where certain things don't exist as labels. When I look at Creatures Lie here, there's a character in there who technically has the symptoms of autism, but it is 1960. 1954 before the description of autism actually exists. So everybody calls him crazy. Everybody thinks that he is insane. You don't have to be something to write about something. All you have to do is generally, if all you have to do if you want to write it to the best of your abilities is to respect it. But please miss me with this idea that we need accurate representations of the stuff in fiction. Tell me where the accurate representations of men are in freaking romance because it's not there. It's a fantasy. And I don't know. I think that it's kind of, I don't want to say a dangerous idea, but it's not a helpful idea to say that if this is in a book, then this is an accurate representation. Because in most cases, books are not accurate representations of anything. Maybe every so often you might find something that is like, oh, I can see that that's based on this thing or inspired by this thing, or that's how this might play out. But to treat a book as if it's history, as if it's real life, is a mistake in the same way that you wouldn't watch Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter as if it were a historical documentary. But I have feelings against this because I don't believe in forcing people to have to be something to write something, in mobbing people. And often this kind of stuff is just used to mob people, to force people down in a competitive field. And we've seen it, where people go on the attack, force somebody to out some kind of personal information of themselves or have their career ruined. And I don't believe in that either. I think that it creates a hostile environment, a scary environment, and it doesn't encourage people to actually branch out to learn better. You're also never going to stop people from being callous. The ones that are actually trying to write something and be understanding are going to be the ones that pay the most when you jump on them for the calling inaccuracies, when some of those inaccuracies may very well be a personal experience. I don't think that we should be judging people based on the contents of their books like this. We should only be judging the contents of the books and not the moral of the character of the, the moral of the author through the contents of the books and i don't think that we should and i don't think that anyone is benefited by creating a special tier system or rather a caste system based on personal labels but that's me and that's why i don't have a lot of faith in the the traditional publishing community because it's not really about the books it's about following market trends and selling to a specific audience and it's not actually taking risks it says it's risk taking but it's not it's doing what is what it considers to be safe based on the algorithms based on what it sees on social media and it saw that this was selling so they were like let's make this our next thing until a couple of years down the line and we switch to whatever the next trend is because because you can follow the trends through the years and see what was popular at different times uh, I think that this is actually just going to create hostility. I think it's going to push people down that don't deserve to be pushed down. And it's going to make some people hate reading because all you see at the top of the reading lists are poorly written books that got published when they shouldn't have been published because of the pet project nature of them. And I'm sorry if that sounds really mean and callous. I think that there is a fair amount of things that need to be discussed but then they turn the discussions into something hostile and make it impossible to have discussions about them. And that was kind of both of the things today is talking about sexism in both ways. You have the, the females, the, the female speakers pushing things onto the male speakers and then the male speakers pushing things onto the general population as well. And then everybody is just kind of stuck in the middle and it sucks because we just want to enjoy stories, man. We just all want to enjoy stories and suddenly now you're not allowed to enjoy stories if you are a female or if you are a male you're not allowed to enjoy stories and hey what do the rest of us freaking do i don't know and then you got this over here and you're like well i was going to write a story but now i'm concerned that people are going to come after me for writing something inaccurate when i didn't even put that in my book i don't want to owe somebody a medical record because i wrote something in a book once <sighs> it's a disaster this isn't what creative writing is for in my opinion uh, so I'm just going to stay in my lane of having fun and doing what I want to do. And I'm going to encourage other people to do the same. And as long as you're doing that, I will have your back. If you want to lean into the writing neurodiverse and selling your medical history for the boost in sales, I mean, that's on you. Uh, it's not something that I would do. It's not something that I encourage. And it's not something that I believe in. But everybody's got the things that they care about, the things that they want to do. And this is not mine. <laughs> so... Um, in this case, live and let live. And hopefully, if you are somebody that believes in this, this topic, uh, don't attack people for being different. You know, you would think that that would be fairly 
fairly obvious, but I know that we're going to have some different opinions from different people because I I know that there are some differently opinionated people in the audience. So thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much for sharing your ideas. Let me know what you think on any of the topic of what you've seen down in the comments below. With that said, have a great weekend and don't die. Was that Wayland Cross in the trunk? Do you know, or is that something that's still being figured out? The person in the trunk was not Wayland Cross. Is he in trouble? We don't know who did it, but as the owner of the car, the longer he's missing, the worse it looks for him. Cross isn't a killer. For the last couple of years, the average number of murders in Baltimore has been over 300, and it's been going up. Mind you, that's only whatever the badges count as official murder, and believe me, there are people that don't count when they die. Wayland? If you're down here, tell me. I'm not talking to the badges, I just... I've been looking for you. They found a body in your trunk. Way. Why? Did you do that? To the left, plain black letters read along the wall. You walked in the corridor. Once that ends, you chose the dark is on the right. My vision goes blurry, flickers black and black and black for longer intervals until I can't see anything at all. I'm not screaming anymore, but my voice echoes back to me. Where the hell am I? You're dead, Josephine. Even smart people do stupid shit sometimes, right?